One of the most enduring debates in this industry is whether whiskey is for drinking or whether whiskey is for basically other purposes, collecting, investing, making loads of money on, whatever you want to call it, there seems to be like a dichotomy between the drinker and the investor or the collector and whatnot. And one of the key, the fundamental fundamental arguments about all of this is how whiskey is priced. Should whiskey be priced towards the drinker so that it's more accessible for the drinkers because they want to drink this amazing whiskey? Or should it be priced more accurately in terms of the open market and sort of like looking at is there any point in underpricing your product? Because we all know that they're all going to make more when you when they eventually appear at auction. So why does some of these distilleries dramatically underprice them? Now, it, you would think it's a really easy decision to make, but it's not. And what I'm hopefully going to explain in this video, how the industry is stuck in this perpetual catch-22 situation where the pricing of the bottles causes benefits and negatives for both parties. Now, it's, it's very easy to see this in simple terms. Investment's bad, whiskey flipping's bad, I want to buy my whiskey cheap. Fine, watch this video and see how complicated the matters are because let's use a case study, let's look at a couple of case studies here or a couple of recent examples to look at the figures that are involved here. So the first one that we're going to talk about is the Springbank 30-year-old. In 2022, they released a 30-year-old with an RRP of £850. £850 for a product that has taken 30 years to produce. It was a limited edition, in all but name, of 1,800 bottles. And since it's been released, the lowest price has been £1,800 at auction, and the highest price is around £3,850. And the prices have stabilised somewhat at about £2,200. And retailers, of course, got that listed for about £6,000. So if we use the low figure, the RRP figure that Springbank used, it was £850 for 1,800 bottles, which would have netted a revenue, a gross revenue of £1.53 million for the distillery. Very simply, it's very simple terms. There's a lot of other nuances in here, but let's just keep going with these figures. Now, if Springbank could price these bottles at the lowest auction price, as in the lowest price the open market was ever prepared to pay for these, then their gross margin or gross revenue would have been £3.24 million. And had they priced it at the retailer price, then they would just be looking under £11 million. So this means that by pricing them at £850 a bottle, they can't stop the secondary market. But what they've actually done is handed over between 1.7 million and 9 million pounds worth of potential revenue over to the hands of collectors, investors, and other businesses. And the other businesses, of course, are being retailers and auction houses, because every time a flipper sells a bottle at auction, the auction house is taking a cut of that. So between 1.7 and 9 million pounds handed over to other people other than their own business. Now, another good example of this is the Macallan Archival series, the Macallan Folio series. Now, the releases number six and seven, I think they were priced at £350 each, and there is about 3,000 bottles in each release. They both peaked at around £2,500 at auction and have currently plummeted because of the economic problems that we're facing at the moment. And again, I think we've got a series of four videos on the channel, so if you're interested in looking at how the whiskey market's developing, go and look at those but they're averaging sort of between 600 and 1,000 pounds uh, and are available at retail for sort of about 18, 1,900 pounds. As such, Macallan gave away around, depending on where you're looking at it, between at least 2 million pounds and as maybe as much as 6.5 million pounds worth of profit, again, to customers, investors, executives, and other businesses each. So that's two to 6.5 million pounds for each release. So this wouldn't make sense in any other, in any other, realm for a business to be to have its op its assets sold openly on the open market so regularly and so frequently where you can basically find the market value for those items and let's remember the Springbank have been underpricing their bottles compared to the open market for a long time and so have Macallan like with those folios they knew the history of these but they continue to price them at the levels that they do now there's a big difference between those two distilleries as well Macallan massive corporately owned by Edrington and Springbank are of course family owned. Now that might alter the pricing structures and that's why I decided to use those as examples because it's quite interesting. But the, the question is here, like there's proof there that they're knowingly undervaluing their bottles or sacrificing profit. Now 
there's something to be said about McAllen and Springbank releasing that those whiskies at the price that they as a business feel that they are worth, which is fine. They're more than entitled to do that, but they are wrong compared to the open market. So somebody's wrong here. Either the open market is wrong or the, the, the producers are wrong. But anyway, why would a company knowingly sacrifice their profit? Well, there's very good reasons for this. In 2022, the Scotch Whiskey Association said that £6.2 billion or 25% of all UK food and drink exports were Scotch whisky. £6.2 billion worth of whisky was exported. Now, pricing appropriately may be the obvious answer for the disparity. So we talked about those distilleries pricing them accordingly. £350 for a no-aid statement Macallan in a fancy tin seems about right. But then again, it doesn't because the Macallan 18-year-old is also about £350. So they're valuing the tin and the production as a, like an, on a no-aid statement whiskey at around the same price as the 18-year-old that they released. So there's something interesting there. So the other way that you can look at this is that distilleries are either knowingly or maybe not directly knowingly doing this or purposefully under underpricing their releases in order to encourage the secondary market, which in turn maintains their long-term profits and also has a lot of other benefits for them. Now, underpricing as a strategy isn't something that's just related to sort of like the world of whiskey. There's wider economic theory about the, 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 the practices of underpricing assets, especially with IPOs or initial public offerings of companies where the actual market value of the shares is higher than the release price. And again, there's loads of documented papers and research that talk about this economic theory of underpricing and how it has benefits. Now, there, the, there, are, there are a number of benefits. It reduces the potential for failure. It satisfies long-term clientele. It provides wealth effects for employees and other executives and other friends. It attracts further interest from non-existing company, uh, from, from non-existing customers, and it provides a general marketing boost as well. So even though they're underpricing or giving away so many profits, they are doing that at the cost of, you know, they are getting further benefits from this, even though it's not necessarily directly related to that sale. So for instance, if they keep these core prices low, you know, these release prices low, they're satisfying their core audience in the terms of Springbank, they're satisfying their core audience and ensuring that their that like base success, they're keeping it at eight hundred pounds because that's the price that we've always released it, and this is a price that we're going to always release it again at in the future. So if you're one of the lucky ones that buy it at RRP directly from the distillery, maybe upon invitation, you kind of get that feel good feeling that you've bought it, and you know that you've got that profit in there. So Springbank, let's say that you bought one of those for eight hundred pounds, Springbank have at least offered you a grand on top of that purchase for buying it directly from them. There's kind of like that incentive to buy it from them. Now, historically, these undervalued prices benefit customers and also staff as well. Again, look at Springbank. We had the countdown collection and there was a special release only for staff members, many of which have appeared on the secondary market at auction and been sold and the money generated. Now, another thing that these lower prices do or this high drive in the secondary market does, it, they might not necessarily enhance the distillery's bottom line on the case of the release, but what it does, it increases the perceived value of that brand. So for instance, and this is exactly what's happened with McAllen, they've been underpricing these releases for so long that for, for so long it was quite quiet, you know, like, you know, the Folio 1s didn't sell out, you know, the Folio 2s didn't sell out, the Folio 3s didn't sell out. It was only in 2018, was it the Folio 3 that came out in 2018? When all the hype started coming with the new distillery, that's kind of when you see every release going to a ballot and then that's when you start seeing this mass hysteria. And how many people now buy and own Macallan because they're doing it for the investment benefits? You know, I run a company that helps people buy and invest in whiskey. And the amount of times that we get phone calls now from people saying, oh, should I buy this new, new release of X, Y, and Z, especially Macallan? And to start with, it was kind of like a younger, very interested, very whiskey demographic sort of person. But now, you're, I'm seriously speaking to sort of like ladies in the late 60s going, oh, I wonder if, if this new McCallum would be a good investment. My son says I should get into the ballot. Like if 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 your mum's, if your mum is buying these bottles on ballot, do you not think the cat's out of the bag on these? But how many people and how many, how many people have been brought into that McCallum brand 
And same with Springbank. So many people get on the Springbank bandwagon because of the profits that they can get. And of course, they don't just necessarily buy these in isolation. They then become fans of the distillery. They then start perhaps buying some bottles to open and enjoy. And it's a kind of a marketing cost. So those millions of pounds that have been given away is in effect a marketing cost of getting customers that are loyal and warm and hot into the business. Now, <laughs> the other thing that drinkers would often state is that whiskey's for drinking. Fine, if you follow that rule directly that whiskey is just for drinking and everything else is superfluous, then why do all these distilleries make limited editions? Why do they put them in fancy packaging? Even in the case of that Macau uh, Springbank 30 year old, it was in a nice gold shiny box. Why does everything have an age statement on it? Why does everything have like bells and whistles on it? If whiskey is just for drinking, stick it in a plain glass bottle, stick the name on a little handwritten label or like a completely nondescript label and sell it as that because it's the contents that's important. But the distilleries recognize that packaging is incredibly important because the packaging is what drives consumers to make the purchase in the first instance. Why do McCallum put whiskey in Lalique decanters if it does nothing for the flavor of the whiskey? Why do Springbank do the countdown collection in a series of special releases, all in fancy boxes or with fancy certificates, if it's not to enhance the flavor of the whiskey? Because if whiskey is for drinking, your focus should solely be on the liquid itself and not necessarily on looking at the bells and whistles that drive commercial success. Now, the packaging is another topic and we, we cover that in a lot of different videos but it seems pretty conclusive that some distilleries are encouraging investors by the nature of their releases by making limited editions by making collections by making fancy packaging they're encouraging investors so who can blame investors and collectors for buying those products that are being marketed and made specifically for them <sighs> anyway the actions of these distilleries are purposefully driving the market. There's a huge volume of bottles in the market now that have come out in recent years that have been released specifically for these collects investors. The folios are a great example. No aid statement, whiskey in a very fancy tin with a very fancy book, but it's not necessarily what sort of they want to sort of do as, 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 as sort of like their, their, their branding because McAllen have sort of always been focused so far so much on the quality of their whiskey. But anyway, this is where we get to the catch-22 situation. If a distillery prices a whiskey at a low price in order to attract the drinkers, let's say Springbank, the problem that that does is that the investors know that the true open market of this value, that of that bottle is much higher and therefore can flip it and make a massive profit, as in with the 30 year old, at least a thousand pounds profit. So they priced it for the drinkers, but there's a huge incentive now there for the collectors, for the collectors to come along with their bots and their scripts and their 400 email addresses into the ballots to try and get them. So that by pricing them low, the actual distilleries are not pricing them for the drinkers, they're actually attracting the investors, which makes it harder for the drinkers to get. And of course you get all this mass hysteria and going up. Now, if you price them for the, the collectors, if you price them at a much higher price, there's, there's there's a problem for that because you isolate your core audience, the drinkers there. You also run the risk of failure. You know, there's something to be said about releasing, let's say the Springbank 30 year old and selling 800, you know, all 1,800 units in four to six weeks and generating one and a half million pounds in revenue, rather than having that inventory and in stock sat there for six, 12, 18 months, not selling. So there is benefits there for them to price it lower. But if Distilleries did price it at the higher market price. They're going to cause so much isolation and they don't know, that, you know, these releases may not be seen as a success, which may have a knock on impact on all of their other releases and all of their other bottles. But that does leave a question of where does that leave the drinkers? Because obviously this is an industry about liquid that is designed for human consumption and inebriation. And I think the reality of it is in this market, we just have to face up that the industry has moved on. The industry has moved on as a whole in terms of their producing products specifically for collectors investors. And we also have to admit that the whole world has moved on where alternative assets as a result of the various financial crisis are now seen as a viable alternative form of investment. That means that if you're used to drinking 30 year old Springbank for five, 800 pounds, I'm afraid those days are probably over. And 
is, you know, when you look at this objectively, is a product that's taken 30 years to produce worth that much money? Likewise, why are people so wedded to a particular brand and a particular whiskey? There are over 140 single malt and grain distilleries in Scotland. So even if you just wanted to stick to Scotch whiskey, there's some incredible whiskies out there. And if you remove age statements from the equation, there are some absolutely incredible whiskies. Like the very good case in point here are the Aaron 25 year olds. Absolutely sensational whiskies. Again, look at Ben Nevis. Ben Nevis from the 1990s, mid 1990s. Loads of Indies are releasing this at the moment, and it's a huge critical acclaim. It's it's really fantastic whiskey. So maybe we just have to sort of like open our eyes and throw the net a bit wider. Maybe the question or the problem is a little bit of a first world problem as well. It's a little bit like a diver saying, God, I remember in the 60s when Rolex used to hand me my Comex or my double red for my undersea work. And now I can't, you know, those watches that I used to wear under the sea are now sort of 10, 50,000 pounds. I just want to wear one. It's my right to own one. Well, you know, the markets have moved on. Everything has moved on. And maybe that is just something that we're going to have to live with as distilleries do more dis like partnerships. McAllen and Bentley, for instance, how is that enhancing the whiskey? It's enhancing sales, it's enhancing the bottom line. Same with Beaumont and Aston Martin, and you've got Glen Turret, I think, have partnered up with Jaguar, and of course Glen Turret are doing a lot of super premium things. But anyway, there is hopefully sort of quite a deep dive into the problem of how do you price whiskies in this market? Do you price it for the drinker or do you price it for the investor? Because either way, you're going to do it wrong. There isn't a way to win in this market. So maybe we just have to live with it. Anyway, I hope you like this video. Watch out on the channel. There's loads more to come. We release one or two times a week. So make sure you like and make sure you subscribe.